Hi, I'm Gabby Vinick, and I'm here with Manu Raju. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Anytime, happy to do it. So tell me more about your time here at UW-Madison. What are some important memories or lessons that you carry with you today? Well, there's a lot. I mean, it was, uh, I, as I've been in the course of this last couple of months, or as I've been trying to rack my brain thinking about all the great times I had in Madison, it's been hard to narrow down uh, what I want to talk about. Because I mean, it was just, I mean, it was four glorious years. I mean, I look back at my time in Wisconsin so uh, fondly, because it was just, I had so much fun. I grew so much as a person, and it set me off as my into my career uh and i really credit my time in wisconsin for doing all of that so um you know i when i was a freshman uh i was in the old augie storms uh that were no longer exist <laughs> probably for good reason um they were they were not in the best condition but we uh made the most of it um and uh i was um trying to you know looking at different things about what I could do to all the different extracurricular activities that were out there. And um, I decided that I was gonna go, and maybe I'll try to write for my student paper because it was just fun. I was a sports fan and you know, my brother, when he went to college was a sports writer for his paper. And I said, you know, maybe I'll, uh, I'll do something like that. Um, so I, you know, at first I saw everybody reading a, a newspaper in class uh, back when print was that uh, the, the thing, and there was no web, um, there was no web uh, news. Um, so I um, I went and I went down the street because I saw everyone reading this newspaper, and I walked into that State Street, and I and I was I said, hey, do you have a job for me? I, I hear you're hiring. I, I thought, are you hiring? I want to, you know, this is, everyone's reading about it. It looks great. Um, it was actually the Onion. Because uh, they were broadcast, they they used to print in Madison, and I didn't realize the Onion was a satirical newspaper published in Madison that all the students read, uh, not so much a student paper. Um, so then I walked away, and I was looking around, and then I started looking. Everyone was also reading the Badger Herald, and I called up Badger Herald, and I said, "Do you have any room for to be a sports writer?" And um, they said. Um, uh, yeah, sure. Why not? Why don't you go down uh, to hockey practice tomorrow, meet the sports editor there, and uh, we'll we'll see about right, looking, writing a story. So I got my first story assignment then as a freshman year, my first semester. I thought that was great. I didn't know what I was doing. I learned a lot. Um, I continued on uh, doing different sport, uh, different uh, journalism type work uh, at WSUM radio freshman year. And there was no sports department back then. That was the internet radio back then when internet radio was not a thing. So there were like four people on staff or something, very small. Um, and I got to do a lot of cool stuff because there was nobody really on staff. So I was, I was, in, I was at press conferences in my freshman year, first semester with Barry Alvarez, asking him questions after games and you know, he was not, <laughs> and they weren't the best questions. One time he shot me down and one question I asked at a press conference, questioning what game I was actually watching. Um, so I learned the uh, art of humility uh, very early. Um, and I just kind of grew as a journalist. And that was just kind of my, on the side. I never really thought I was gonna really pursue journalism. I thought it was just kind of a fun thing to do on the side. And I pursued my business degree. I got, I went to Granger. I got inside of my sophomore year and I was still, you know, having fun meeting a lot of friends, a lot of lifelong friends now, and, you know, hanging out on State Street, going to house parties, having a great time in college. So doing kind of everything that, you know, Wisconsin uh, has to offer. And, you know, what really was by the time that I was about to graduate, I realized that, you know, I really did enjoy my time, you know, doing, working at the Badger Herald. I'd been there for, did that for four years. I became sports center there eventually. Um, and then I decided, um, you know, this is where I want to go. And I really credit my time learning there, doing things and getting that kind of experience uh, for helping me, like helping me move towards that in my, that direction in my career. Absolutely. And it's so reassuring to hear those words. I think many students often feel like they have to commit to a certain major or career path in order to land a desired job or in a particular field. So I don't know yeah. if you could speak to that as well. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Because look, I mean, 
if you go and you do, if you, uh, you pursue a career that is consistent with whatever you majored in in uh, college, that's great. I mean, if you go do pre-med and then you go to medical school, you're, you end up becoming a lawyer and you do have majored in something similar to law or science or whatever, that's great. It's awesome. More power to you. But a lot of people don't. A lot of people like me, you know, they pursue something they thought was interesting in college and maybe get some really interesting classes, but it just didn't end up fitting with my career path. So, and that's totally fine. I mean, the thing that I, I really try to tell folks is that like, you know, you should really be open to trying to explore new things, take challenges, take some risks, uh, even if it does not appear that like, you know, maybe you don't, maybe you don't really know about it. You can learn on the job. You can learn from other people. And if it interests you, continue to pursue it, even if that, that's not necessarily what your background is in. But, you know, people will look back at and say, you know, University of Wisconsin is a fantastic um, education. You, you, you've gotten a great degree as graduates. Um, and people, look, you know, in all fields will respect the work, your, the fact that you graduated from Wisconsin. So it doesn't really necessarily, if you change your career trajectory from different from your major, it's fine. I mean, especially since, you know, you've got a four-year degree from a great school. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I want to get to talking about your experience working as CNN chief congressional correspondent. Specifically, how do you today navigate all of the daily pressures and working in such a fast-paced news environment? You know, it's very challenging because my day starts pretty much from the moment I wake up until late at night. And especially when it's um, when there's a lot going on in the news cycle, which is seems to be always the case. But especially this year, especially during the Trump era and before that, um, you know, I kind of go into the day. If it's a general congressional day, day where the House and the Senate are in session, um, you know, I go into the day with a general uh uh, roadmap about what's what's going on. Um, you know, I will. Um, uh, you know, it's I wake up about six a.m. and I'm already dealt with dealing with emails from my bosses who are up an hour, hour and a half before me sometimes as they're getting ready for the day and preparing for their morning conference calls. They have an, we have an eight a.m. news at a, a news gathering call where our bosses all report into like what what is the big story on their particular beat, what's going on at Capitol Hill, things that I am uh, um, uh, working on, things that my other reporter colleagues are working on. And so that helps structure the news programs of the news agenda of the day. And they show us each develop their plans. And then at nine o'clock, the larger network has an editorial conference call to discuss you know, what, what people see as the big stories, what our boss Jeff Zucker weighs in on as well. Uh, that happens while I'm pursuing my own path. I usually have a roadmap of what's going on. I, I know, okay, the house is in session at, at nine, they're voting at 11, the Senate is voting at noon. Uh, Joe Manchin is in, going to a hearing at 10 a.m. I need to ask Joe Manchin question X, Y, and Z. I can grab him before a hearing here. And then, and then if, if I need to grab Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi as she's leaving her office to go to the votes at 11, hopefully I can get Manchin at 10, grab him at 11, and then come run back to the Senate for noon votes. And then just I kind of juggling like five or six different things. And sometimes it's, I'm covering the story of the day, like the latest development on, you know, the Build Back Better bill or the infrastructure negotiations. Or sometimes I'm working on a more a story that takes more time to um, develop an enterprise story, something that um, I will have, I would let, I need to gather some reporting for. So if I see Senator Susan Collins who needs to weigh in about something about, I don't know, the vaccine mandate or something that I'm working on, I'll ask her about that. Or if I'm working on a story about the big backlog in ambassadorships that because of Ted Cruz and I see a Republican Senator who wants to get ambassadors confirmed, I may grab him or her. So like, I will try to, I have a list of stories that I'm doing I have specific pursuits and I have to have an idea of what the schedule is in the House and the Senate and try to be various places at the right time. So much about Capitol Hill is being at the right place at the right time. You gotta be in the hallways, you gotta grab people as they're going in between meetings. There's a speaker is only available when she's in the hallway. You can ask her a question and hopefully she'll respond and make a news making answer. And you also, so you basically have to be really, really well organized, know what you're gonna 
what you're pursuing, know what to ask when you see someone, and have a general idea of what you're reporting. And then on top of that, you have to balance, okay, am I writing a story for CNN.com? I got to write a story, especially if it's breaking news, deal with that. Or if I'm a longer story, finish my longer story. Um, and then plan live shots that are already, that are coming down. I'll have a request for be live at 10 a.m. 11 a.m., 12 noon, and figure out where I need to be for those live shots. So it's a combination of, of it's a major balancing act while you're really multitasking all day long. But at the beginning of the day, it really requires organization and kind of knowing where you, what you need to do and what you need to pursue and being able to think on your feet when news breaks or something changes pretty quickly. Wow, that's incredible. And you have I'll add one more. Add- I'll add one more. I'll have one more complication on top of it. As a as a TV reporter too, it's um, it's you know there are only certain places in the Capitol where you can actually get people on camera. So I have to make a decision. If I need to get Joe Manchin on camera, I will go into the office buildings where I can get him. But if he's not, if I need to get some senator who's there just to get information, I may forego my effort to get Joe Manchin on camera. But I need to get another senator who is in a place where I'm not allowed to shoot but I can still interview him or her and try to get information from them. So you'll have to make really split decisions about what do you want, you need information or you need to get someone on camera to put them on TV. So all those kind of decisions are constantly making through the course of the day. It's incredible that you're able to manage it all. And especially having to ask these very high profile politicians such tough and important questions. I am sure so many people are curious to know what your approaches to interviewing and storytelling when you are able to you know reach them in the hall yeah so like my my you know everyone has a different style of interviewing you know my view of it is I don't want to ask questions in which I am just going asking a 40 second question or two minutes of giving a speech and having someone respond to my speech like I want to ask them very direct very pointed questions that will get them to make news, to get them to take a position on something, get them to answer something that they very, very clearly do not want to answer. And oftentimes when they are not answering your question, it's very clear to the viewer, that is news. So I have to think when I'm coming into the day, like how, if I see Nancy Pelosi, I need to ask her about this. So just, you know, just because this is on my mind, because it happened like yesterday, I think it's all a blur, but I think it was yesterday, the day before, um, you know, a big co- question had been about Nancy Pelosi about, you know, whether or not she's going to come or uh, punish, or the House Democrats are going to punish uh, Lauren Boebert for making uh, Islamic phobic comics about uh, Ilhan Omar. And Pelosi very clearly does not want to do anything about it. Um, the progressives want Boebert to be punished. And going into the, her press conference this week, I knew that she didn't, wasn't going to answer. I knew she was going to shut down the question about it. So I had to figure out a way to ask her the question. So I asked her a question about, I, 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 I framed it in a way she has said, I said, you said that Republicans should police their own um, uh, members. You say that they should police their own members. Uh, but the Democrats have punished two other members, Paul Gosar and Marjorie Taylor Greene. Why is the situation with Lauren Boebert any different? So it kind of forced her to respond to why she has said, why she's, she's taking a different position now, but then she wouldn't also explain what she plans to do about Lauren, Lauren Boebert. So that got her to answer the question and also sidestep what they plan to do about it. So it showed people who are following it and reader, or readers and viewers She's being evasive about the topic. And two, it got her to at least give some sense of her thinking about where she is. So, you know, part of the challenge as, as a reporter is, you know, how do you get someone to respond to something? And my view of it is very direct, very targeted questions, and hopefully questions that no matter how they answer or don't answer, ultimately gets them to make some news. It sounds like it takes so much preparation, but also what, like you said before, being able to think quickly on your feet. And you had mentioned how you try to also think about, you know, what is the big story of the day? And I'm curious if there's any one story 
that you have covered that continues to resonate with you today and why? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's so hard to, when I think back about stuff I've done over my career, I mean, it's, it's just a big, everything is a big blur. I mean, it, it just really is because we do so much on such a day, daily basis and I come home and I, you know, I start thinking about what I'm doing the next day. So uh, it always makes it a little complicated. But look, I think the Trump uh, impeachments uh, were um, obviously very, uh, I mean, there's only been four impeachments in American history and I covered two of them. So and they both were in the last, what, two years? So, uh, and those were huge stories. They both were such different stories. You know, the, the first impeachment was a serious it was a it was a weeks long, months long investigation. It was an incredibly hard story to cover. That was because so many of these uh, witnesses who were testifying about Trump's conversations with Ukraine and the pressure he was putting on the Ukraine president to investigate the Bidens uh, and his you know the administration withholding a security aid to Ukraine. And there were so many witnesses who were part of that, but they were all going behind closed doors. And they were going behind closed doors in classified briefing rooms for eight, 10 hours. And it was just a total nightmare as a reporter to cover because there was high interest. Everybody wanted to know what they were saying, especially at my network. Um, and it was they were behind closed doors. So how do you figure out what someone's saying behind closed doors? So it required just a lot of you know me just hammering my sources, figuring out where to be to get the right people to ask the right questions, and just having the experience and covering the Hill and knowing where I could catch different people who at different times who may know what was going on. Um, so, um, you know, there was one episode where like there was a huge, there was a very important witness, his name was David Holmes, he was coming in to uh, interview and he was going to get, we didn't know what he was going to say. He was a, he was a U U.S. official based in Ukraine. And he apparently had overheard a conversation between Trump and the EU ambassador about uh, Ukraine. And no one knew what he was going to say, but I got, you know, I, I had a source leak me the testimony and I got the testimony and I literally went on air with the testimony. I had read, I even read it read it for the first time on air to Wolf Blitzer for around about 12 minutes and everybody was around me, all my competitors listening to what he was saying because no one even knew, not even me until I actually read it myself. Um, and it was pretty, uh, it was a pretty revealing testimony. Um, uh, so that was actually, that kind of thing sticks out to me. Um, and look, also being in the Capitol on January 6th, that was a, uh, uh, covering the impeachment after that you know, January 6th, we can talk about if you want to in more detail. Um, but even the impeachment after that was really, um, you know, it happened quickly and it was so intense. And I'll never forget just being at that press conference the next day with Nancy Pelosi saying he must resign or he's going to get impeached. And to me, that really just stuck out as, you know, something that was just we're living through just an unbelievably remarkable um, chain a series of events you know that led to Trump being impeached one week later which of course has never happened before. Wow and I definitely want to talk about covering the January 6th insurrection. What was it like on the ground reporting and how did it feel trying to report on what was happening while also trying to stay safe? Yeah, it was a uh, it was a very uh, yeah. I always look back on that day and think that we just never had any clear idea how much danger we were in, uh, because I was I naively thought I was perfectly safe, which I really was not. Uh, you know, I was. We came into the day knowing it was going to be a big, busy day. It was the day, of course, where they they were going to try to challenge the electoral results at the time they had planned to do it on four states, and this is a process that we thought we knew was going to take all day long, all through the night. Um, but, um, and we knew that it was a Trump rally going on. Um, um, oops, there. We knew there was a, we knew there was a Trump rally going on. Um, and, um, uh, but one thing that we did not uh, uh, realize, uh, uh, we did obviously didn't have any sense of what was gonna happen, right? So uh, when, um, the first real warning sign came when suddenly there was some building that was uh, right by the Capitol on the House side that had been, uh, there's 
concerned about some suspicious packages. People were told to not leave. They were investigating it. You know, that is not totally abnormal, but it was a jittery day. So people were paying attention to it. They were, I was sitting in my booth at the time, the third floor of the Senate, uh, waiting, monitoring the debate in the House and the Senate over the electoral challenges. Um, and then um, uh, at the time, um, um, you know, I, we, we, they were debating breaking out of that live coverage of what's happening on the floor and coming and bringing me in to talk about what's happening with this suspicious package, what's going on. But then it, that, that scare cleared. So we thought, okay, I guess everything is fine. They figured out it was just nothing, we move on. Soon after that, my colleague, Ted Barrett comes in and he says to me, he says, uh, this, is a real, um, this is a real problem. Uh, there's, a, there's a lockdown going on. They're telling us all to get back into our booths and lock our doors. And I'm like, what? Because so the situation outside is getting really precarious and it's getting, it's getting, you know, the security situation is getting tenuous. And I was checking with some folks and they were saying that the exterior perimeter had been breached. So that means people had gone inside the first layer of fencing uh, near the Capitol. So at that point, we told, we reported that internally. And I got a news, I got, an, I got, a, I got a security threat alert from Capitol Police. And they said, stay in your boots. You're in a lockdown. There's an external security threat. Okay, so then at that point, Wolf, they, we broke out of the live coverage on the House and Senate floor. Wolf brought me in and I started to explain what was going on. I, I've only been in two lockdowns at that point uh, in my career uh, in the Capitol. And so this was obviously a serious, serious situation. Um, but I remember Wolf asked me, he said, there's no way anyone could get in the building. Is there money? And I'm like, ah, no, this is a really secure building, Wolf. It should be fine. <laughs> so lo and behold, you know, about 10, 15 minutes later, my one of my producers showed me a uh, a tweet from one of our, co our colleagues who was in the, in the halls that had a picture of the mob on the second floor of the Senate. I just could not believe my eyes. And then I got an email from the Capitol Police saying, you know, internal security alert. Get in your rooms. Don't make any sounds. Lock your doors. So um, that point, it was obviously became much more serious. And then Wolf said, this is not, I mean, what do, this seems like a very dangerous situation. I'm like, yes, this is incredibly dangerous. Well, obviously these people didn't go to the metal detectors. We don't know what they have in there, in their possession. And, um, you know, meantime, I thought I was fine because I was on the third floor of the Senate. And I should explain that in the booth where we are on the radio TV gallery on the third floor of the Senate, we have our own camera in our CNN booth. So that's where I can broadcast live from. And we're locked. You know, we have, a, we have a door, we're locked in our door. There's also, it's in the gallery. The gallery has its own door, it's locked. But, you know, there's, it can easily be breached. The door can easily be breached, especially one that has window panes on it. Um, we were very fortunate that the mob did not realize where the press was, even because our, our offices are not really marked. It's a pretty nondescript location. So by the time that, um, you know, we, we have been broadcasting for hours. I was getting reports about what was going in. I was emailing sources. We were relying on pool reports. I was key, I was basically live for about four straight hours. Then suddenly the cop knocked on our door and said, "You got to evacuate. We got to evacuate. We got to evacuate." And so we were forced to leave. Um, at that point, that's when the National Guard had come in. So this complex had gotten secure, but they were trying to clear out everybody out of the Senate wing of the Capitol. And when I walked outside, that was the first time I realized like how close they were because right outside our booths, uh, outside the gallery, it was totally trashed, stuff was knocked over, it smelled like smoke bombs. There were like, there was this, uh, there's clearly tear gas that had been emitted because there was this like slippery, grassy, uh, greasy uh, film that was all over the, um, the banisters and the floor. And you know, hand sanitizer stations have been knocked over. It was just a total, it looked like a war zone. And I did a live shot from my phone as I was walking to our secure location. And I said, you know, it does look like a war zone out here. Um, so at that point, you know, we got, we went to a secure spot. We were doing broadcasting live from there. And eventually they brought us back to the Senate a few hours later. So it was just a crazy day because it was an adrenaline, adrenaline rushing day your adrenaline is pumping all day and really had no idea what was going on and, and it really just took some time to just understand just how insane and how crazy and how scary of a situation that it was 
Wow, I cannot imagine that. You're really there on the front lines as history is being made. So. Yeah, and you truly are reporting what's in your eyes and ears at that point, like what you're seeing, what you're hearing, and trying to just be able to, um, you know, able to explain people what's going on very, uh, you know, very directly, very precisely, and try not to be too rattled about it, too. Definitely. And when you are thinking more broadly about the future of journalism, with January insur the insurrection being a huge turning point in history, what does the future of journalism look like for you? You know, it's changed so much since I started. I mean, after I graduated Wisconsin, um, I uh, I was working in the summer after my senior year at uh, NBC 15. I was on the assi weekend assignment desk there. It was a fun uh, part-time job I was doing. Uh, and then at that point, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I, I knew I wanted to be a journalist, but I didn't know exactly what kind of journalist. So I started to apply to a whole bunch of um, places. And um, I moved out to Washington only because my folks had relocated from the Chicago area to DC, to the DC burbs. And I decided, you know what, I'll live with them, look for work in journalism in, in Washington. And I got a job writing for a trade publication uh, covering in, environmental policy. And I didn't know anything about government. I didn't know anything about environmental policy. I barely knew anything about how to be a reporter. Um, but I learned really all of that in my, you know, in my career. And I, you know, as I was trying different things and really practicing and stuff, I say that as a way to answer your question, because at that time, you know, we had a website that was updated and that's in the, in the first publication, which is called Inside Washington Publishers. Uh, we had, and we had some they had narrow verticals that covered specific areas of policy news. Mine was called Inside EPA, insideepa.com, only updated once a day. I think if that, maybe once every other day. Um, the Washington Post at the time, they had a separate uh, web uh, team. That was an entire news gathering staff for the web versus print. It was not integrated. CNN did not have nearly the operation it has now. And now everything is being integrated. Everybody is, has a, Washington Post is a video component. Washington Post has a, uh, obviously has a digital and a news print component. We have a big digital presence. We also have obviously a big TV presence. So a lot of the news organizations are doing similar things because they can offer a variety of different platforms. Um, you know, we at CNN are moving big time into like the streaming part. The CNN Plus is coming out next year, which is TV, is a streaming, essentially a streaming television network because of the, you know, obviously people are not watching as much TV and are moving on to watching streaming services uh, on their on their TV. So, um, you know, that is going to be uh, where I think a big focus is going to be of the news organizations putting a lot of money into original programming that will go on the streaming services. You know, but for me, like my, I just kind of view my job as I had, I, my job is to write a good stories on CNN.com, find out the facts, write, report it on TV. And if the mediums change, I have to just, I have to be consistent with my work and I can do it in whatever medium that we offer at that time. It's really interesting to learn how it has evolved throughout the years. And now we have a whole class that is ready to graduate. So I'm wondering what advice you would like to share as they begin their careers. So I would say a few things. One, I would say definitely be open to trying new things. You know, take a risk. And that's going to be a, a theme of two of my of my my speech on uh, Sunday of graduation is you know, feel, you know, take take risks. Be uh, okay with trying something so trying something new. I mean, I I jumped into something that I had no idea. I didn't know anything about Washington. I didn't know anything about covering environmental policy at the time. I, you know, I I just kind of learned it on the on the, on the fly. My next job, where I went to Congressional Quarterly, I learned it as I was doing the job uh, covering Congress. And then when I went to the Hill newspaper, I had a different beat. I was covering politics more generally, uh, and I was covering the Senate leadership for them. Uh, I moved off from being an energy reporter to a Senate leadership reporter. So I learned that, uh, even though I had never really covered general politics. And then I moved over to Politico, drawing on my experiences from my other jobs. And at Politico, I started to do more TV and I started to learn how to be on TV. And that led to my next job. So I really didn't know when I left um, uh, what Wisconsin, where I, what I wanted to be and where I would end up. 
which part of Charles I would end up in. And, but I was open to trying different things, whether it be TV, whether it be local news, whether it be national news, whether it be a producer, whether it be a reporter, whether it be a newspaper reporter. Like I just wanted to try a lot of different things. So that's a big thing. Just be flexible about what, about the different opportunities that, all, that are offered to you. Take an opportunity that is presented itself to you, even if it's not your end all be all, learn from it, get better, and then continue to progress in your career. Write as much as you can. It's really good to be a good writer and that helps. How do you become a good writer? You just do more of it. I was, I was not a very good writer when I first started, but I continued to write and I feel like I've really uh, developed strong writing skills just because of so many years of practice, but you know, just more and more, the, the better you become. And look, I would also say that like, it's not a problem not knowing something and being new. One of the benefits you have of being a new uh, reporter is that you don't know anything. You, you're learning on the job and it's okay to, be, to say, I don't know, can you explain it to me? But it's totally, it's actually better. You're in an advantage in a lot of ways than, than I am as an experienced reporter. Because if you don't know something, you can have someone explain it to you. And then you can learn more than perhaps I can because someone may assume I already know. So take advantage of being new, try different things. And if you get rejected from something, it's a journalism a hard field to break into. I, I, I don't want to sugarcoat that. It is, it's challenging, but for, don't give up if you really want to do it. I applied for so many jobs, you know, my, my first job, my second job, my third job. I applied for tons of jobs. I got turned down all the time. People discouraged me. Another thing I'll talk about too on, on Sunday. You just need to really uh, push ahead and try to see what presents itself to you. And then hopefully something will work out. So don't give up. It, you know, it's, there's a lot of opportunity that's out there. Well, thank you so, so much for all the advice that you shared and taking the time to speak with me today. Yeah, no problem. And there's my, my, t my terrace chair that I'm sure you see uh, right, right behind me. Uh, I use this for my, this is my uh, at home live shot location. So I, I always have my terrace shot in the background. So, so uh, Wisconsin folks, when they see it, they, they, they love seeing the terrace chair in the background of my CNN live shots. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, it's a necessary addition to any uh, any home outdoor uh, space.